And so the Persian Empire uh, was all involved with this, and he showed his intent to, to conquer this Persian Empire, and he came onto the, the soil of, of that Asian area, and he took a spear, and he just rammed it into the ground, and he said, I am conquering this as a gift to the gods. What a skewed motivation, right? Mm -hmm. And so he showed his eagerness to fight, and, and uh, he was just always ready to go and ready to just take it all for the glory of his false gods. But before the, the battle campaign began, he, he was very wise. He went to all of his main leaders, and, and he, he just had this conversation with them and said, how are you doing? Are, are you set financially? Because, because this is going to be a long campaign, and you're going to have to leave your families for a while. And, and in, in fact, you, you might not come back. So, are you set? Are you ready to go? And, and they would tell him what their needs were. And so he would give them wealth and riches and lands to make them financially secure. Boy, that's, talk about <clears throat> wise leadership. Just making sure your people have what they need. Making sure that they know that, that you know, you're, you're going to take care of them one way or another. And so, so he was wise in this way. And so he was garnering the support of all of his top leaders, but his top general came and approached him and said, after, after Alexander had given away most of the personal wealth that he had, because he knew it was an investment, he knew he was going to get back far more in the end. And he said, <clears throat> you have given nearly everything away. What have you kept for yourself? And Alexander the Great said, hope. I have hope. And the general said, in that case, we who share in your labors will also take part in your hopes. And then he refused the estate allotted to him, and several other kings actually refused too, in honor of Alexander. And so, this is a fantastic story, but it is the totally wrong concept of hope. Yeah. Totally worldly, totally skewed, totally twisted. You know, the world loves to do that to us. Have you noticed that? They'll take our Bible terms and they will hijack them and they will twist them. Do it all the time. They do it all the time. That's right. Hope is one of them. Love is another. <laughs> oh, it's messed up, isn't it? Messed up. <laughs> right? Well, you think about this. If you ask people, and I'm sure this has happened to you, and you say, are you going to heaven? What's the first thing most people say? Yep. I hope so. They say, I hope so. <laughs> they say, I hope so. That's right. You know why? Because when the world takes that word hope, they, they get it twisted around to mean wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Are you going to heaven? Well, be nice. Maybe. I don't know. I hope so. Uh, That's wishful thinking. Yeah. I don't know how people live like that. But the Word of God has something different to say uh -huh. about hope. Yes. And in this particular passage, we see that at the heart of hope, here's the notions of two things. We see relationship and reward. Uh -huh. That's what hope is all about. Yeah. And you say, <clears throat> Pastor Andrew, you, I was there. I was right there with you <laughs> until you said, what, what are you talking about? Relationship and reward. So let's look at it. So when we consider hope, biblical hope, Christian hope, we must understand hope in terms of relationship and reward. So let's think about this. The verse that we are focusing in on, verse 27, the mystery revealed, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, we're going to talk about relationship. Why am I talking about relationship? Christ in you. That's relationship. You got Christ and you got you. Relationship is at the heart of this biblical notion of hope. But, but in relationship, Christ in you, Christ in me, Christ in us as believers, that relationship, but there's, there's even two parts to that. First is Christ, the designated Savior. Let's think about the designated Savior for just a moment. Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which we're familiar with, which is the same as Messiah. So in the Old Covenant writings, we have Messiah, which comes from the Hebrew, Moshiach. 
And then in the New Testament, we have Christ, which comes from Christos. But they mean the same thing. It means the anointed one or the chosen one. So we have the designated Savior. Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes. So I want you to try to figure out who this he is. Who is he? When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. You figure out who that is? That old wicked snake, Herod. The one who wanted to just devour the Christ child. And so we see, even at that point, there was a designated Savior because all of the chief priests and the scribes were coming and saying, the Christ, the Messiah, is going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of what? The Holy Spirit. Oh, what a miracle that is. What a miracle. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In the original, they didn't even speak Hebrew in this culture. Hebrew had, had become an, an extinct language just about, except for religious reasons, but they spoke Aramaic, and his name was Yeshua, mm -hmm. and it means God saves. What a, what a name to give the designated Savior. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the designated Savior. And you think about that. If you look at the heart of God and the mind of God, and you look all through these Old Covenant writings and prophecies, you'll see the heart of God is to save humanity from sin. But you know what? He could have done that a million different ways, right? God could have, God, God could have done this. He could, have, he could have created every person that would ever exist at one time as mature adults and say, I love you, you're saved. But he didn't do it that way, did he? Yeah, we're all born in different times and different eras. We all come to, to, to faith. We all come to salvation at different times and different ways. We all have to come through God's man, who is Jesus of Nazareth, right? Mm -hmm. But, but it's, we all have different life experiences. And, and, and God could have chosen a, a million different... He could have made some kind of holy lottery. Can I use those two words in the same breath? <laughs> holy and lottery? He could have made some kind of holy lottery and said, you know... You, 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 nope, nope, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, off to heaven you will go. I mean, God, God could have done all kinds of different ways. But he chose to send his only begotten son. The one and only. You know, Jesus is the one and only. Some people think he's just the best of many. Mm. But he's not the best of many. He's, he's the, the one, one that's and right. only. Right. And that's what we stand on. So there, there is this designated Savior, and it's Jesus and Jesus alone. And so when we talk about this relationship, it's not only Christ in you as the designated Savior, but, but it's you, the sanctified believer. Some of us are a little more sanctified than others. Amen. I'm not looking at you for any reason at all. It just, I just happen to look that way. <laughs> Some, you know, and, and we're all on that path of sanctification. Amen. Some of us, our, our, our spiritual life runs a little deeper. Mm. Some are a little more shallow and a little more esoteric. But you know what? It's all about discipleship. And discipleship is not about information. It's about transformation. Amen. Amen. And you know what? Sometimes transformation is like this, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's like this. Yeah. And so we, we need to be patient with one another. Because you might not be as holy as me. And I might not be as holy as you. Amen. So we love each other. But, but in you, the designated Savior and the sanctified believer... John 17, verses 20 to 23, which is the, the true Lord's Prayer. We talk about the Lord's Prayer, but it's really not. That's the disciples' prayer, really. Yeah. But this is, this is really the Lord's Prayer. John 17, 20 to 23. Jesus is praying to the Father in the presence of his disciples, the eleven remaining. I do not pray for these alone, these right in front of me, these eleven. I do not pray for these alone but also for those. So we got the these and the those. But for those 
who will believe in me through their word, mm -hmm. that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. He's, he's talking about the eleven right there, but he's saying... Lord, they're going to have this amazing ministry and they're going to turn the world upside down. And the church is going to be birthed on the day of Pentecost. And the message of the power of the gospel is going to go out. And people are going to hear it and believe it and receive it and be saved. Because of these 11 that are sitting here in total perplexed state. <laughs> they don't know what's going on right now. But he's saying, I'm praying for these and I'm praying for those. And guess what? i got good news for you. You are one of those. Mm -hmm. I am one of those. Jesus was praying for you and for me right at that moment. Isn't that mm -hmm. astounding? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? I think he prayed for Bernie a little more than us. But anyway, you're, <laughs> yeah. just, you're just fun to... <laughs> he had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I won't do any more. I'm moving on to Joey. So, anyway, so that they may be one in us and the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. And here it is. I in them and you in me. Mm -hmm. That they may be what? Made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So when we talk about hope, we have to talk about relationship. And in this relationship, Christ in you, the designated Savior and the sanctified believer. And then we see here when we consider hope, biblical hope, Christian hope. We must understand hope in terms of not only relationship, but now reward. In terms of reward. How am I getting that? Well, look at the verse in 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the reward. The hope of glory. Everybody loves a reward. Have you ever opened a, a new bank account where they give you a free toaster? you ever get a free toaster for opening no. a bank account? Mm. Some people are going, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, they used to do that kind of stuff. I don't know. I remember as a kid. Back in the 70s, they did it, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember as a kid, if you went to the gas station and filled up your gas tank, they gave you a steak knife. Yeah. Oh, we had steak knives. Yeah, we Green had stamp. drawers yep. of drawers of yep. yeah. We used to get suckers. When I was got, a little kid. You got then. suckers. Yeah, or you go to the I bank. That old, you go know. to the drive-through in the bank. They give you a suck. You know, everybody loves just a little treat, right? Everybody mm -hmm. loves a little reward. And you know, even you know, some of the stuff we talked about was you know from the '70s and the mm -hmm. stuff they used to do. You know, yeah. yeah, but they, they you know they still do stuff today. They've got all kinds of incentives and rewards. But I want to ask you this. Can we expect, as believers, any future rewards? Oh, yeah. You should, you, yeah, you should think of it that way, but you can. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, we've got... Now, now, think of it this way. We have a heavenly reward coming. Mm. Not that we earned it, not all that right. we deserve it, no. but maybe some of you have had... Uh, mamas or, or, or grandmothers that used to talk about their heavenly reward. Yeah. You know, just put it in that in those yeah. terms, right? Well, this is what we're talking about. This this is our heavenly reward. It's the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. The hope of glory. So the first thing we look at when we talk about the hope, there's the the confident expectation. We talked about that a little bit already. How the world doesn't really see it as confident expectation, but it's real more wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. But that's not biblical. That, that's not part of our Christian heritage. That's not part of our Christian faith. You know, wishful thinking is not going to cut it. It's confident expectation. It reminds me of a story I heard. An yeah, old guy was, was walking through the park and, and he looked over it and he saw the, the ball diamond and the kids were playing a ball game and mm -hmm. he thought, well, that would be kind of nice to watch. So he kind of he kind of meandered over there and he he got there where the backstop is in the dugout, and he kind of looked down in there on the bench and was watching the boys, and he says, how's your game going? And he says, well, it's 18 to nothing. We're behind a little bit. <laughs> and he says, my goodness. He says, I bet you're discouraged. And the boy says, discouraged? Mister, we're not discouraged. He says, you're not? He says, we ain't even got up to bat yet. <laughs> and you know what? That's a much yep, better picture. Yep. That's a much better picture of hope yep. than Alexander the Great had. Right. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Because this boy had a confident expectation that they 
they could do something, that they could still get something out of it. Now, it's still not a completely biblical example, but you see what I'm saying. There's this comparison yeah. that, that there's a confident expectation. Why can we have that confident expectation? How can we know this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First thing you can do is when you're studying through Scripture, you go back to the original language and you see what the words are, and then you get a Greek dictionary and you look up the word for hope, and here's what it says in the Greek lexicon. It says to expect or confide, to have hope, to trust, and the root of it is to anticipate, usually with pleasure, expectation or confidence, faith and hope. Well, I get that right out of the Greek lexicon. So that's, that's pretty much a no-brainer. That's what the word translates into. That's what the word mm -hmm. means. But there's something more important than the Greek lexicon, and that's the word of God itself. So what does it say in Romans 5.5? 5, 5? Now hope does not disappoint. Well, that's an amazing statement right there. Now if hope is what the world says, if hope is only wishful thinking... How can Romans 5.5 5 say, and our hope does not disappoint? Because we're always going to be disappointed in wishful thinking, right? Because what if we wish the wrong thing? <laughs> what if we're out of God's will? What if we're not in tune with the Holy Spirit? So, hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by whom? The Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, that's how we know that hope is confident expectation. So, we look at the word itself, what it really means. We look at how it's used in other portions of Scripture. The relationship and the reward. The relationship and the reward. But don't forget that the term reward can also have a negative connotation. I've already reminded you about your grandmothers talking about their heavenly reward, but guess what? There, there is a hellish reward too. If you look up, talking about dictionaries, if you look up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, reward is defined as something that is given in return for good or evil. Done. Something that is given in return for good or evil. Done. So reward can be a very positive, great thing, or it can be a very negative, harsh thing. And this is a great place for the gospel. Because you know what? We are a, placed among a lost and dying culture that has a hellish reward coming to them. And they hope, <laughs> if they're just good enough, if they can get to church enough, if they can put enough money in that plate, if they can, if they can help this person enough, or do this, or do that, that maybe... Just maybe, God will have mercy on them. Or they're counting on, you know what? I'm better than that guy. Mm. Yeah, I got my problems, but I'm better than him. Right? Yeah. And so, so this is why the message of the gospel is so important. This is why God has commissioned us as ambassadors of Christ. Because people have no hope, really. They don't. If they don't have Jesus Christ living in their hearts and souls, if they're not followers of Jesus, they, are, they have no hope. They're hopeless. Truly hopeless. Because hope is not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation. You know, I talk about the five terrible truths very often. We're all born in sin. We all deserve death and hell. We cannot save ourselves. We must be saved. We need a Savior. Those are the five terrible truths. You know, if you think about that, that's really all bad news. Yeah. But what does gospel mean? It means the good yeah, news right. of Christ. Why is the good news so good? Because the bad news is so that's right. bad. Yeah. You think about this. Genesis through... Well, no, no, I'm, I'm, stop, I'm not going to Revelation. <laughs> I'm not going to Revelation. I'm going to Malachi. Genesis to Malachi. This is the bad news. Matthew through Revelation is the good news. You see, those five terrible... You know, the, the old circuit rider evangelist... Oh, my evangelist left me. The, the old <laughs> circuit rider evangelist. You know what they used to say? You can't get a man saved until you get him lost. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
People have to see yeah, their need. Yeah, they, need to see. they have to see their sin. Yeah. They have to see how hopeless they are. So when we talk about hope, we talk about relationship, we talk about reward, the hope of glory, but also that hope being confident expectation. But now we look at the glory. So we see the confident expectation, but we also see the eternal destination. The eternal destination. Now, for those outside Christ, their eternal destination is, is, a, is a horrible thing. But in Christ, when He is our hope, our eternal destination is going to be glorious. That word glory means the brightest, purest, whitest light you can imagine. I don't know if you've ever done anything crazy like this, trying to look at the sun for a second. Mm -hmm. The sun is nothing compared to the glory of God. Amen. It is, it is a, just like a little match being lit in a dark room. The sun is compared to the glory of God. But glory is not only the brightest, purest, whitest light, it's also just a kind of a term for heaven. We've talked about our grandmothers already, talked about a heavenly reward, but they might have also said, when I go on to glory, you've heard people talk yeah. that way, they're talking about going to heaven, right? When they get to glory, it's a term for heaven. Why? Revelation 21, verses 10 to 23, it says, and he carried me away in the spirit. So here's the apostle John talking about an angel of the Lord that has kind of caught him up into this vision, into this reverie, and is giving him this holy tour of the heavenlies. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Isn't that going to be an amazing thing right. to witness? I mean, can you even, you just think about this massive metropolis just descending down to be able to, to witness and be a part of what that's going to be. It, our minds can't even figure it out. Having what? The glory of God. And her light was like a most precious stone. The city had no need, here in verse 23, had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Yes. Verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 24, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. So this idea of glory, the eternal destination is this, very simply, an expression of eternal closeness with God. Never separated, only peaceful perfection. And the thing about hope, it's so not only misused, why? Because it's misunderstood. And you think about this, and people talk, talk this way all the time, but as Christians, we cannot let ourselves be sucked into the narrative of the secular we don't cling to hope. We stand firmly in it. You see what I'm saying? There's a we don't cling to hope. We're, we're not these helpless, weak, pathetic, like the ship is going down and I'm just grabbing on to whatever. We don't cling to hope. We stand in our hope. Yeah. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So, wrapping this up, I just want to ask you, do you have that confident expectation of this? Is that your life story? Is that your understanding and your personal application of hope? And so here's what I just want to say in closing, just two things. We need to give people hope because people are hopeless. They need to understand what hope is really about, that it's not clinging to something that you're not sure if you can hold on to or not. It's not wishful thinking. We need to give our people hope. The ending is the reward, but the beginning is the relationship. Remember, we're talking about relationship and reward. The end is the reward, but the beginning of it is relationship. We need to give people hope, and the only way we can do that is by giving them Jesus. We need to give our people hope. And then we need to give not only our people hope, but we need to give the lost hope. Because the lost have no hope. They are truly hopeless. So, may God's word bless you richly. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for the power of your word, the clarity of it.
Lord, use it in our hearts and in our lives. Help us to be able to stand it firmly in our hope. And that hope is Christ in us. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.